so another part of my work is investigations and open rescues, documenting open rescues and working undercover. Unfortunately, um, a lot of doors aren't open to me when I want to show the kinds of ways that we treat animals. Um, sometimes the doors are open, but not often. Uh, it's really hard to get into these places, so I work with different uh, investigative groups around the globe, and I go in and I, I document for them so that they can use these images for their campaigns. This is at a, um, a layer hen farm in Spain, and this shed alone had 40,000 birds. And I, again, like my job is to put a, a, um, a face to the suffering. Again, we can't comprehend a billion birds. We can't comprehend sometimes even a hundred. But we can look at this picture and see what they're going through. This is actually at a um, free range, organic, all this um, place, cruelty free, whatever, whatever they call it. But uh, they're being rounded up for slaughter here. He's grabbing six at a time by their legs upside down and throwing them into the truck. And again, putting a face to the suffering. Um, I've spent a lot of time at fox farms, uh, raccoon dog farms, mink farms. Uh, they're so stressed out, these animals, that they, um, they basically cannibalize each other. So they all have injuries. But this doesn't actually affect the, the price of the pelt. These injuries that happen around the ears are often missing parts of their face, their ears, and their neck. What kills me about this picture is that their senses are so much stronger than ours, their, um, their sense of smell. We walked through the forest to this place, and our eyes were watering from the ammonia and from the absolute stench. But here are animals living right above their own stench for their entire lives. This is the kind of crowded space that they live in. And uh, it's good to show people these pictures when they think that fur trim is OK. You know, only it's only a little bit of animal. Or maybe I've even heard um, they just shave the animal. They don't kill the animal. They just shave it for the hair. No and about the cannibalism that happens there, um, stress-related stress cannibalism. Well, if you put these free-roaming animals who live solitary lives in confinement like this, this is what happens. And um, she's also she's one of the animals that I keep very close to my heart. Um, she watched me as I went up and down the room photographing the pigs and crates. and. And again, always trying to show things from the, from the animal's perspective, which can be difficult. But I included this picture because of that looming shadow of man coming towards. And it was fascinating. It's fascinating photographing at rodeos and places of entertainment with animals because you wonder what the kids know. Like, would the kids, what would the kids think if they knew that if this greyhound wasn't fast enough, um, that, the, that the, the dog would eventually be destroyed. I wish the kids had access to this kind of information or were told the truth or... Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, of course, of course, of course, we need to know where our food comes from so that we can all be conscious consumers. I'm sure a lot of us in the room think that way, but we're not the norm. So getting the message out there, we always have to you know, be pushing that and um, bearing witness and showing others. This is that calf, Joanne, that you met earlier being taken away from her mom. So monkeys are, as well as you know, um, affected by our consumer choices as well because they're tested on. Uh, I was working undercover. Some of you may have seen the film Maximum Tolerated Dose. This is a film that just came out about um, animals used in research. And it's a, um, it interviews a lot of uh, doctors who took part and then stepped away and now speak out against it, people from PCRM and uh, all sorts of really interesting people. So for this film, we wanted to show, OK, so where do these animals come from before they're in a lab? Because when we think of animals in a lab, we think of that. We think of a monkey in a cage somewhere sterile. But what was their life before? And we wanted to show that. So we posed as buyers. And we went in. And uh, this guy is actually showing me his product. And that's, those are the words that he uses. My, these are our product. And as he went to pick up this mom, the baby grabbed on at the last minute. And oh, it's really hard to photograph. <laughs> hard to know that this happens. And this is you know, one picture. But of course, they're living like this by the hundreds of thousands in these countries before they're shipped off internationally to be used.
the one on the right is blind, and the one on the left was giving up his portion of food to protect that macaque. Love and liberation, happy endings. <laughs> because regular people can do amazing things. <laughs> this is um, a chicken who's just been removed from a factory farm. I was documenting an open rescue by Igualdad Animal in Spain. And uh, what they do is they, they um, it's not ALF style animal liberation front where they you know, put a mask on and go in and liberate animals. Um, they show their faces. These are activists who say, I'm going to speak up against this. We're going to go into a farm. We're going to film everything. And then we're going to tell the world what we've done. We've removed five animals. We're going to show what their lives were like. We're going to talk about it. We're going to put this out to the media. And we're going to bring the animals to good homes to show the whole spectrum. So I'm a big fan of, of open rescues. They're really, really educational. This chicken had no idea what was going on. <laughs> She'd spent her life as a layer hen in this dark, this dark factory. And she's at the vet right now. <laughs> she's like, let me out of here. <laughs> What's going on? I mean, she'd never even seen daylight. It, it must have been just really like sensory overload for her. Um, this is at Healesville Sanctuary in Australia. And this is a little Joey. The mom had been um, crossing road and was hit by a car. But the people, it was nice. They didn't just drive off. Like They got out and checked the mom, and they saw that there was a baby in her, in her pouch. So they brought the baby to a sanctuary. And the sanctuary emulated a pouch and uh, was you know, feeding the baby and, and raising him. I don't know if they'd be able to put him out in the wild again, but they were regardless going to give him a good sanctuary home. And it, I was just waiting and waiting. I was looking into this pouch. and the. The baby just stuck his head out for a second, and I took this one picture, and then he went back in. <laughs> Happy endings. Um, it's even hard to tell what animal this is. Uh, he's a, a poodle cross, and he was in a puppy mill in Quebec uh, for eight years. And this is the moment that he's being rescued. And this is probably the first time he's ever been held with such tenderness. Uh, the volunteer's name is Arden, and I don't know the dog's name now, but the dog did get treated for all of his ailments, and he was fostered, and he has a, he has a permanent home now. Any questions? Okay. This is another open rescue with Igualdad Animal, animal equality. And then there are famous people like, I'm just, I think I skipped some slides there. Um, this is Lek. This is a really great sanctuary you can volunteer at in Thailand. Um, she uh, has always had a love for, anim uh, for elephants, and she lived around them. And there's just too many elephants on the street in Thailand. So she started this sanctuary, and it's done. When they work you know, with legislation. They rescue. They do education. It's a really, really great place. It's called Elephant Nature Park. This is at the recent uh, stuff going on in Toronto with the shark fin ban. And so people, regular people, were taking time off work to go to City Hall to put in their five cents. And this went on for days and days. It was really, really inspiring to see all these people come in to speak up against, um, against shark finning. And this was in 2006 after Hurricane Katrina hit um, the southern US. Uh, six months, so this is six months later. And this, the shelters were still absolutely full of animals. And there were people you know, by the hundreds down there uh, helping the animals. And this guy, his job was to clean all of the little pens for the dogs who were still waiting to find their family or to be adopted. And I went into the pen and photographed him cleaning. And he said he'd really fallen in love with this dog. And then he just got down. And the dog got on his lap he came over here. And, and he said, yep, yeah, that's it. He's like, OK. Anyway, he adopted the dog. And he, he had driven all the way from the Northwest down to New Orleans to, to volunteer here. And this dog has a good home now with this guy. This next picture is really funny. It's with the SPCA cruelty investigators. <laughs> 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 and they get very, very serious calls all the time, but sometimes they're just downright funny. Like, I love the way they're looking. The neighbor called and said, there's a dog on the ledge. <laughs> and I just love the way they're sizing each other up in this picture. <laughs> the dog got down safely. <laughs> and uh, again, like, 
just regular people doing extraordinary things. If you've been to India, you know that the dogs are just in dire straits in this country. They're skinny, they're mangy, they're beaten, they die. There's just It's a bad place for them. But up in the north in Dharamsala, all the dogs are healthy there. And they're calm, and they're not begging, and they're just sleeping in the sun on the streets. And I thought, OK, something, what is going on here? And I noticed, because I spent a lot of time there, that around 5 o'clock when it was getting dark, they started going up the hill. So I followed them. And they were going to this woman's house. She lives, her house is um, basically the size of where I'm standing right here. Full of puppies, full of bags of dog food. The dogs are like on the steps everywhere and she feeds them. Every penny that she has, she feeds the dogs, she vaccinates them, and she spay neuters the dogs. Really, really amazing. Um, she, her name's Dr. Devi. Um, oh, as I had done a fundraiser for um, the Tibetan Children's Village to raise money for kids, I did that with the animals in India as well. Um, there's always a way to give back, as you guys know. Fundraising is great, and there's so many ways of doing it. So I had an exhibit of my animal pictures from India, and the money went to the um, Animal India Trust, Dr. Devi, and, uh, and it was enough money for them to buy a truck to go around to collect dogs to vaccinate, spay, and neuter them, and then release them. Uh, she's, she's forever in my heart as well. Look at what condition she's in. And she actually walked like that. She was so crippled that she walked with her legs crossed. And she's the reason that, yeah. 